Um, so it, it was mentioned before that, um, that epilepsy uh, and depression uh, actually occur quite commonly together. And uh, when you look at epidemiological studies, it actually shows us that of the patients with epilepsy, at least coming through a neurologist's clinic, 30% um, uh, of them would have depression or anxiety or some type of mood disorder. And it's possible that that number is even higher, but that there are uh, lower detection rates than we would like. That's actually quite similar to patients with any chronic uh, medical condition. If you compare that to the average uh, prevalence of depression in the general population, that number is between 12 to 15 percent. So you can say that, uh, that depression is twice as common or twice as prevalent in patients with epilepsy. And so you might ask yourself, why does that happen? And I think, you know, I, can, I, I have put a list here of, of the things that might contribute um, to someone becoming depressed when you have a diagnosis of epilepsy, and it's certainly not exhaustive. And I think you've heard from, um, from Wendy uh, some other factors. So for some people, their education is interrupted. I recently had a, uh, an elderly patient, and it, you know he was telling me his story. And back then, when you were diagnosed with epilepsy, it automatically meant that you could not go to school. Um, and he had dreamt of becoming uh, a scientist. He had fondly referred to himself as the nerd in his class. He loved chemistry and he loved physics. And suddenly, it wasn't just even getting a diagnosis of epilepsy, but his entire future, as he had planned it and envisioned it, was taken away from him. Um, so it can interrupt education. It can affect employability. This means that there might be financial stressors. It takes away people's independence. Um, you heard Dr. Kennedy mentioned about maybe not being able to have a shower without being supervised. People have restrictions on cooking. Um, it might affect the type of recreational activities that you can do. I have patients who enjoy swimming and they have limitations on what they can do uh, in, in a swimming pool. Um, and as you've heard from Wendy, there are things like maybe acceptance within the family, which is difficult because, because you might seek support from people who are close to you and from your family members. So when you don't have that support available to you, you can start to feel very alone. Uh, and then there's also the impact on caregivers, um, uh, loved ones, close ones, who might make compromises in order to provide care, depending on the level of care that's required, depending on the severity or the level of control of the epilepsy. Uh, and when people have to make compromises like that, then the person might end up feeling guilty uh, that their loved one has to give up a job or something to stay home with the person. So it ends up having all these different uh, psychosocial effects and ripple effects. Um, and these are very important losses. So uh, as you know, um, a diagnosis of epilepsy is not just a diagnosis. All of this other stuff comes with it. Stigma was mentioned as well. And the thing is, once you have comorbid depression and anxiety, then that also has an effect on the epilepsy. So it's a bi-directional relationship. As you've heard Wendy say, when her mood was really low and things were difficult, you don't feel like doing anything. And for some people, even getting up and getting out of bed is difficult, never mind taking medications. Um, we also know that in patients who have epilepsy, and comorbid depression and anxiety, it is much more difficult to get control of the seizures and their seizure frequency might be much higher. And sometimes people might end up on multiple epilepsy medications or higher doses if that depression and anxiety isn't also managed. So we, it is important that we detect it and it's important that we treat it in patients with epilepsy not only for the treatment of that depression, but also bearing in mind this bi-directional relationship. Now, there are other factors that have been looked at as to why would depression and anxiety and mood disorders be almost twice as prevalent in patients with epilepsy versus the generalized population. And there are many studies that look at 
various biological factors. Maybe it's the type of seizures, maybe it's the, it's the particular epilepsy syndrome, uh, maybe it's which side your epileptic focus is on or the type of epileptic focus you have. And so there are some studies which will say, yes, we found that left-sided lesions are more associated with depression, and then there are other studies which fail to replicate that finding. So we don't have studies that definitively say to us that th these are the biological factors in epilepsy that predict depression. But then, so, so a lot of studies have then looked at all, all, the, all the factors, biological and psychosocial factors, and they've tried to look to apply the uh, necessary, the relevant statistics to try to figure out which factors might be most predictive. And of all the factors they looked at, the only biological factor that was predictive of depression and epilepsy is also predictive of depression anyway, and that is genetics, so family history. Apart from that, the factors which were predictive of depression were these four, increased financial stress, which was related to uh, change in sort of educational trajectory, uh, limitations in employability, life stressors, which is also a predictive factor in depression in general, even outside of epilepsy, poor adjustment to seizures, and lack of control over the illness. And what do those two tell you? It, it's about adjustment to the seizures, it's about coping, it's about the word that Wendy used at the end, it's about acceptance, but it takes a while to get there. It doesn't happen right away, right? Um, and it's interesting because if you look at predictive factors of depression and other chronic medical illnesses, not just epilepsy, these factors are among, are among those as well. So when we're talking about coping with epilepsy, it's quite similar and it's the same concept as to coping with a chronic medical illness, any chronic medical illness. There might be some things that are very specific to epilepsy because of the restrictions that are imposed on patients with epilepsy, like restrictions with driving and so on. Um, but at the, at the end, this kind of boils down to coping and acceptance. Um, so what is coping? Um, Coping is a very complex psychological process, um, and psychology itself is, ex is extremely complex because there are so many different factors that determine how uh, an individual is going to react to a particular difficult situation. And each individual is going to react differently. And the reason is because we have so many things that determine how we cope, um, personality traits, et cetera, et cetera, those are the things that make us individual. But a lot of those mechanisms um, are very, they're happening at a very sort of unconscious level. In other words, if, if I have to deal with a difficult situation, I don't consciously and cognitively sort of figure out, oh, I'm going to use this coping mechanism and I'm going to react this way. It doesn't happen like that, right? A reaction just comes out. But where does that reaction come from? Um, and it comes from our individual self, um, which is very complex, which we try to understand in psychiatry. We're not super good at it, but we're trying to understand it. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we understand about coping. Now, the whole point of coping <clears throat> is to lead us to acceptance. Because if we, if we can get to acceptance, we can start to conceptualize the difficulty that we're facing uh, in a way that might be more adaptive to us. In other words, in a way that might lead to more positive emotional and behavioral outcome. Behavioral meaning what happens in my life, right? Um, so Lepowski is a very famous guy who spoke about, he was, he's a Polish uh, consultation liaison psychiatrist. Um, and uh, he did a lot of work on uh, coping with chronic medical illness. And essentially he said, listen, we can have coping mechanisms that serve us well, adaptive, or we can have coping mechanisms that don't serve us so well, maladaptive, okay? So, um, so they lead to sort of negative emotion and those negative emotions then get us stuck and, and we can't move forward. Um, and essentially, so here, here's sort of a little box. So the blue box shows the adaptive coping mechanisms and the orange box is the maladaptive ones. Now, 
like I said, coping is a very complex psychological process. And as you have heard from Wendy's speech, it's a journey, as she appropriately named her talk. So it takes a long time. So I'm not going to be able to um, sit here and help you cope better. But the, but the reason that I put this list here is because it starts with a bit of self-reflection. And so if you sort of have a look at that list and you ask yourself, um, or one asks themselves if you're struggling, um, maybe I can get some hints. Maybe I can sort of do some self-reflection and look at this and figure out, am I doing some of the stuff that's in that orange box? Maybe I can look over at, at that blue box and see some of the things that might serve me better, right? But, um, but it, it takes time and it takes reflection and, and there is a stage before we reach to acceptance. And I could hear um, there's actually uh, stages of acceptance that we speak about in psychiatry. And the initial stage they talk about is that sort of um, anger and not wanting to sort of even sort of disbelief, not even wanting to accept that this is actually happening. And uh, Wendy, through your story, I, can, I, I could have identified the different stages of acceptance as you spoke about how difficult this was and I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want any part of this. Um, until you reach to a point where you have acceptance and you said, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to try this, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Epilepsy Toronto. But what led to that change? to try to do something, whether it was to go to Epilepsy Toronto or to do something else, to try to make things better. It's not until there is that acceptance. And we can't, and, and we do go through a natural stage. So it's okay at the start if you're angry and in disbelief. It's human, it's a human process. And it's okay if after that you're struggling with it and there is a bit of ambivalence and, and you feel down about it. Again, that's human. But it's important that, those, that there's someone to uh, convey those feelings to so that that can be monitored to ensure that this is not just, that this is not, and I don't mean to say just, but it's not sadness about a condition and it hasn't led to a clinical depression where, where there's a associated risk like, um, like thinking about death or suicide, okay? And that's why it's important, even if you're not seeing a psychiatrist, if you're having those difficulties, it's important to convey those symptoms uh, to your doctor because they can refer you to different resources or a psychiatrist if needed, um, if, you know, if the doctor deems that that's appropriate based on what you are reporting. Um, now, Lepowski essentially said, but below that, Below our coping mechanisms, where does it come from, that, that sort of automatic response that we're going to have? It comes from somewhere deeper. So then he talks about illness concepts. And what essentially what that means is, what is our interpretation of what is happening to us? How do we view this, right? And similarly, in the black circle, he talks about these are some examples of healthy responses to illness. This is a challenge. So if you can imagine, you look at the yellow circle and you, you see, if, if I, for example, if I said to myself, this is punishment, I would have thoughts like, why is this happening to me? This is not fair. I didn't do, I haven't hurt anybody. I'm a good person. Those are the kind of thoughts that you end up, that you would have. If in your mind, you're conceptualizing it as punishment at a very unconscious level. And when we have those kind of thoughts, it will, I would feel, I would feel sad, I would feel angry, I would feel betrayed by life, but I'm, but I'm not gonna move forward with those kinds of thoughts. Whereas if I said, okay, this terrible thing has been thrown at me, and it's very challenging, but I'm going to have to do something to try to keep moving forward, this is a challenge. So this is what Lepowski is getting at. The, based on the illness concept, you may employ a different, adapt, a different coping mechanism. If I think of it as a challenge, I'm more, like, more likely, for example, to engage in problem solving. If I think of it as punishment, I'm probably more likely to end up with sort of self-deprecating thoughts, negative thoughts, feeling like I'm being punished for no good reason. And again, it's a list in order for you to just reflect on it and maybe try to look at um, can I, 
is it possible for me to, now that I'm aware of this, so what I was saying is coping mechanisms, they happen sort of automatically. We don't, we don't plan how we're going to react to something. But if we're, use, if we're not coping well, that's when we need to try to figure out this stuff, like what is coping and what are these unconscious thoughts and mechanisms, so that we can bring them into our cognitive awareness. Because if we're aware of what's happening and how our perceptions might be affecting the way we cope, then we can deliberately um, try to, to adjust things. And you, we can deliberately say, look, it looks like I've been trying, that I, that I was denying what's happening. And that's, you know, so maybe I'm going to look over on this side and try to look at, can I try to do some of those things instead? Can I try to have a different illness concept instead? So bringing it into cognitive awareness can help us to deliberately uh, change the sort of the tools that we use in order to help us cope more adaptively. Now, this is one slide and I've listed a few ideas about personality. Um, personality, like I said, it's, it's psychology is extremely complex. It is definitely not fully understood. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna get uh, talk much uh, detail about that, but again, the point is to put those that list of things there so that we can have a snapshot of what are the things within myself. Can I identify to, with any of these? Can I relate to any of these? Can I change things that I might be finding myself doing when I look at this list? Can I change it if this is going to help me uh, to cope more adaptively? For example, quality of mood. Um, the intensity of my emotional reactions. So that's the purpose of putting a list like this out. To talk about personality would be um, several years. <laughs> um, and, and, and again, uh, conversely, this is a list of things that may not lead to healthy coping. So excessive denial, uh, blaming others. Um, I don't know if this is there, but you know, taking what is my responsibility in my illness. My doctors have a role, uh, the social workers have a role, I have a role as well. What is my role? Uh, medication compliance, lifestyle management, etc. cetera. Um, one strategy, and you've heard um, very, I think, uh, practical and inspiring strategies uh, from Wendy. Another possible strategy is, um, I often talk to patients about a gratitude journal. Um, and it's just, it helps uh, for example, when we look at quality of mood as a personality trait, right? Um, so, so something like, how would I go about changing that if I can relate to maybe uh, not having the quality of mood that serves me best? Well, uh, having a gratitude journal can help you to positively, uh, positively appraise your situation. And it's not about being happy about having epilepsy, but it is about a quality of life with epilepsy integrated in that life. It's about understanding that epilepsy is a part of your life, but it isn't the whole thing. You are not just a patient with epilepsy. You are a person. You have epilepsy, and you are also somebody's son or daughter, and brother or sister, and friend, and employee, or employer, um, and partner. So you are those many things, and, and you have things that you like to do. You have hobbies, and you have interests, and you have chores, and maybe you have children, you have parents. So that, that's called, you know, we have something called a life chart, and essentially the life chart looks like a pie chart. You can draw a circle, and you can think about the things I was just saying, and you can sort of divvy it up and put all the different roles that you serve in your life. And as you add more and more pieces, you will see epilepsy will become, it'll get crowded, and you will realize that epilepsy is one part of the sum of you. So coping is not necessarily about being happy. I'm not asking, suggesting people have to be happy about having epilepsy, but understanding that, it, that, that you are more than just someone with epilepsy, but how do I integrate the rest, how do I integrate that in the, into the rest of my life? Understanding that this is a chronic medical condition. And so a gratitude journal can help to help us sort of uh, keep positive because without a positive mood and some of the other uh, stuff that I showed, personality traits, it's difficult to do a lot of the stuff that, that I'm suggesting. It's, it's hard to have that motivation. It's hard to have that uh, willpower 
um, without uh, those without sort of a positive mood and some of the other factors. And um, this is a quote from Oprah Winfrey that I got off the internet. Um, but it's, she says, every night, list five things that you are grateful for. What it will begin to do is change your perspective of your day and your life. And so it's about, so that's exactly what it is, about changing perspective. In, in psychotherapy, we call this cognitive reframing. And it means changing the way we are interpreting or perceiving things so that we can have a better emotional outcome. Because if we're in a better mental space, then we have the wherewithal to do some of the other things that we need to do to keep ourselves healthy, like baking and going out and seeing friends and dancing. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the treatment of depression in epilepsy. And um, it's not terribly different from the treatment of depression uh, in the sense that the approach is the same. Um, the approach is what we call a biopsychosocial approach. And what that means is, this is a medical condition that also impacts you psychologically and socially. Therefore, we have to treat all um, aspects. We have, to treat the, we have to treat biologically, and we have to look at psychological and social interventions. And if we leave out any of that, then the treatment isn't whole. It's not where it's, something's missing from the treatment. It's not just about taking medications and getting rid of seizures. For some people, controlling epilepsy might mean having a seizure once a month. For other people, it might be once a year. The other thing is, studies tell us that depression and mood disorders and anxiety is not reliably related to how many seizures you're having, to your seizure frequency. So there can be people with epilepsy who have one seizure a year and have depression. And there can be people with epilepsy who have one seizure a month and do not have depression. So there are other factors. It's not necessarily about the control about seizure control. It's a lot of some of the other stuff I was talking about. Acceptance, positive coping, quality of mood, um, and, and perception, right? Um, so the biological interventions, I'm not going to go into too much detail about, but um, if, there, if anyone has questions, certainly in the question and answer period, I can take them. But uh, pharmacotherapy means medication. Uh, we have various somatic therapies for depression. Um, some of them are, ECT is uh, very, very safe um, in epilepsy, and it's in fact is used for um, a, a particular phase of epilepsy um, that we call status epilepticus. Some of you might know what that is. Um, and then uh, those other abbreviations are different stimulation techniques, and uh, there have been a few studies looking at impact of depression or um, mood adverse effects and so on. Um, and light therapy, which is usually used for seasonal affective disorder, was recently also approved for use in just depression, not necessarily with a seasonal pattern. Um, of course, that if, if someone has a light sensitive epilepsy, so photosensitivity, then that's going, that may not be an option. So those are biological interventions. Um, social interventions, Essentially, what social means, it's lifestyle management, is what is the stuff that you can do? Um, but this is difficult to do if, if there isn't acceptance and if there isn't positive coping, right? Because if there isn't positive coping, then you end up in, in a state of this low mood where you feel stuck. And then all this other stuff gets very hard to do. So social rhythm therapy. Um, this essentially means to live your life uh, with a certain routine um, that is um, that aligns with your natural biological rhythm. Okay, so those things involve sleep, and I specifically wrote nighttime sleep because I have several patients who will say, "Well, I sleep in the day," <laughs> but our biological rhythm tells us that we need to sleep when it's dark. We have hormonal changes when that happens. We have changes in the brain when it goes dark. We are meant to sleep in the night. And for a patient, to, normally we need six to eight hours of sleep. Patients with epilepsy might need the higher end of that, about seven to eight hours. Some patients with epilepsy need more than that, eight to 10 hours. But it's important that you have proper sleep at night. 
And sleep hygiene means, you know, we have sleep hygiene pamphlets. I have this at my clinic that I give to patients. They are evidence-based recommendations um, to practice to, uh, to sort of facilitate um, uh, proper sleep. Having a routine, um, and so putting things in a schedule. A lot of people may not be employed. It doesn't mean that you get up and sort of not show what the day holds or that you get up at various times. I always tell my patient, part of sleep hygiene is you are into bed and out of bed at the same time every, every night and every morning, regardless of what your schedule looks like. And even if you're not working, it would be helpful and it will mitigate um, sort of negative mood uh, if, you had put, if you put things in a schedule. So even if it's chores, physical activity, and some of the other um, activities that we're gonna talk, that, that we'll mention. Um, but it's important to have a schedule. And I always say to patients, even if you take someone who doesn't have depression or a chronic medical illness, and you keep them at home with nothing to do and no schedule, and they can sleep and wake whenever they want, they will start to have low energy and low mood and poor motivation, okay? So schedule, very important. Diet is the other one that uh, we need to follow this uh, biological rhythm. Uh, some patients might be on a specific diet called a ketogenic diet. Um, unless you're on that specific diet for epilepsy, it's a balanced diet and you need to eat regularly. I have patients who skip meals and they don't eat until four. Rapid changes in your blood sugar is also not good for mood. Uh, and physical activity. There are studies which say that 20 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity, four out of seven days a week or more, will have an independent treatment effect on mood, anxiety, and cognition. Um, of course, less is fine, but that amount of more has a statistically significant effect on mood. So, um, and I say medically advised, because maybe not everyone with epilepsy might be able to engage in certain types of, uh, of uh, physical activity, so we usually uh, consult with your neurologist uh, before. Um, and treatment compliance. So those are the things, those are some of the things that you can do. Um, so it means taking your medications and seeing your doctors, reporting on side effects. If you are not taking the medication for a specific reason, let your doctor know that. Um, it's not, nobody will be punitive with you. Uh, it is important to understand if you're not taking your medication, what might be the reasons and what are the obstacles and how can we help with that, okay? Um, education. So, like I said, when I started, some patients, some people, there was a time where some people thought, uh, where we thought that uh, you couldn't, it meant uh, leaving school. Um, what, if you look at coping and you look at outcomes, the outcomes are probably two big ones. Number one is optimizing function. What is the most that I can do and the best that I can be? And the other is optimizing quality of life. Um, can I have the things in my life that at least make me feel good? Um, family, friends, um, a hobby, uh, interests, okay? Uh, an, you know, a comfortable place to sleep, uh, things like that. Um, so quality of life and optimizing function. If we think what the optimizing function means, we're not going to know what our highest potential is. Unless we, uh, unless we aim sort of big um, or dream big or aim high. And so it's important for us to know that not because a person has epilepsy, it doesn't mean that they can't do certain things. Patients have proved us wrong many times. I've had patients who were told, you know, they've had an accident, they won't walk again, and they have. Um, so your true potential is within you, and it's how hard you push. So you may be able to get that educational achievement. Maybe it'll take you longer, that's okay. Maybe you need some special accommodations, that's okay. If you can still get there, it doesn't matter if it takes you six years or four years. And then doctors can write letters of accommodation uh, for school to help advocate. Employment, um, this website will sort of tell you your rights. Um, because a lot of patients with epilepsy face um, uh, maybe uh, employers are sort of concerned about liability if there is a seizure. Um, and it's important to know your rights. Um, 
there's actually the Geneva Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, which I was actually on the review committee for that, uh, has been ratified by Canada, which means that um, that convention is adopted in our national law. And if you go into that website, you will see things such as if an employment application asks for your medical conditions, you are not obligated to say that. You don't have to say that. If you are given an offer of employment, then you might want to say after the offer that you have those conditions. One advantage of saying what your medical condition is is that you can ask for accommodation, right? But you can go into that website and um, it will talk about what your rights are in terms of employment. Um, because a person should be given an offer of employment based on your merit, not on your medical condition or lack of. Um, and then social interventions. So, I mean, the other social interventions. This is community and family supports. This is a lot of what Wendy spoke about. Once there was that acceptance, she, you know, she spoke about uh, wanting to dance, um, even though it was out of the comfort zone. She loves baking, um, so she would bake, um, you know, many different treats. So pursuing your interests, whether it's art, whether it's baking, cooking, dance, studying a foreign language, anything. I have a patient who joined a sewing group. Um, and she did remarkably well. She made a couple of friends. They've gone traveling. Um, she's sewing her own clothes. She came with beautiful summer dresses uh, over the summer. It was, um, so, so these things are important. They sound like small things, but these things are very important because this is part of, these are the, ter are the determinants of quality of life. It's having, being able to pursue the things we like, being able to have things that we enjoy, having that sense of, Pleasure, that you get pleasure out of things. Having people that you like around you, family and or friends. Um, and making sure that you keep socially active. One of the things that depression does to us is it makes us want to hide away by ourselves and socially isolate and not pick up the phone and not talk to anyone. And um, we always talk about reactivation of social networks as a treatment for depression. And it means staying involved uh, in social activity, because uh, it's because if we if we give into that social isolation, we're we're going to fuel uh, that depression. And uh, psychological intervention. So these can be things like from basic support, deep breathing exercises, which are more effective than lorazepam for a panic attack, for anxiety, also relaxation, problem solving. Um, MBSR means mindfulness-based stress reduction. Some of you may. Um, and it can go from there to more structured and formal psychotherapy, um, such as cognitive behavior therapy, interpersonal therapy, that's what IPT means. Uh, MBCT means mindful, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So these are more structured um, uh, type of psychotherapies, and the first line, second line refers to the, um, what we call, their guidelines for uh, treatment of depression. Um, and at this stage, I'm going to actually hand over uh, to Catherine. We'll pick up on some of these other psychological interventions and community.